It's going to have a spooky vibe to it. This I'm trying to make it a little, yeah, because uh, it, it, it fits with our guest. Um, it but does. We'll get to, we don't, we don't want to, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We will get to our excellent our guest, guest uh, shortly, How but we have, I'm good, buddy. How are you? Are you missing Look me us. now that I'm not in LA? I do miss you. I, I was in LA you. for three months and we, I, I think we saw each other twice. <laughs> it was, uh, it was not enough, but those moments yeah. were. We saw each other more on, on, on touched online me. like this. Yeah, we did. I felt like I was know, talking to you right. nonstop. So Very I mean, let's body. not. I mean, yeah. you weren't abandoned. We were. No, that was, we were it was nice. deeply in contact. Yeah, and I got to, I got to see Christina. That's Tom's. That's Tom's wife. Anyone who doesn't know that. And that's a um, far superior visit than yeah. uh, than me and your kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah this was this nice. was a good. And it's how's it in New York? It's been good. You're taking care of it. It's, uh, New York. Oh, it's uh, today. Uh, today spring. Uh, leapt into full gear today. It's like 75 degrees. Um, leaves uh, are, are, were, were just like like screaming. They were they were they were sprouting so fast. It was That's just sounded like a horror show in the screaming park. Screaming leaves just, is ah! always a good sign. Just, yeah. I'm, I'm sprouting leaves. <laughs> oh! <laughs> photosynthesis and oh. joy. Of course, or, it's New York, so yeah. no one paid any attention. So yeah, um, yeah the yeah. screams are left unanswered in New yeah. York. In the canyons of those buildings. Um, hey, we have to uh, do a couple things yes. that are important. First of all, yeah, we need to remind our. If you're enjoying our content uh, of really, please subscribe. Please like and subscribe, and please uh, leave some comments and yes. and all that stuff. We we read yeah, everything. Reviews. We look um, at all that. Yeah, stuff you like, don't like, whatever. It's uh, we would love to hear from you, and and please uh, click on that button there or whatever you need to do to. Um, get us uh, full time um, yes. into your homes, both, both on your podcasting app apps and on yes. your and, and or if you're watching us on the YouTube, all that um, stuff. Yeah, we they have. Want to hear from you? Push. We yeah. love you and want to hear from you. And speaking of that, we have some very special Patreon uh, members that we want to call out today. Yes, because uh, we're, we're we've decided to try and make being a Patreon member uh, less lame. Uh, yeah, we're going we're, to we're be gonna actually try to get some stuff done. We're going to pay more attention go. to our to our loyalist our loyalist listeners. Is that yeah. is that a is that accurate? A, yes. Does that make uh, sense? Loyalist is a word, isn't it? But that would not in that context. Loyal, loyaler, loyaler sounds weird. Loyal, All right, oops, I don't need that. That's do you have the list, just, Dave? Yeah, hang on. I do. What are you have, doing? Do you have are the you, list? Do you not have the list? I've got. The are list. you making a call? What's happening over there? No, people. I was getting a. Uh, I was getting a, a calendar alert. Oh, well, this um, is important. You got to focus right. on this. Put your calendar you away. Go. So we want to thank some of our our, our, uh, our our patrons. Do you have the list in front of you, Tom? I Should do. I you want me to start going? Okay. Well, the fr well, the second one, you should probably, yeah, definitely. You do well, the yeah, first we've got Ben yeah, Kaboom. Thank you. Bill Wheeler. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I he's, believe he's near and dear to my heart. Chip Knee, Chris Hartman, Christine Herholtz, Christine Terbihe? Terbige? That's Look, if you're uh, not gonna take this seriously. I'll take over. I'm Emily trying. Fagan. <laughs> I am trying. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm not sure how you pronounce that either. Ter, 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 ter gay. Yes. Ter beige, but we're grateful, beige, Christine. Maybe? Wherever yeah, thank you. Are. you. Um, we'll try to get someone to get of us a phonetic reading on that. Yes. Uh, we have em Emily Fagan, uh, mm -hmm. Evie or Evie, uh, Gus Olson, Hella. Uh, uh, Jean Anzulis or Jean very Anzulis? Own Jean Anzulis, yes. Oh, it's oh, it's that Jean Anzulis. Yes, now I recognize. I would think name. so. Yeah, we love you, yes. Jean, who has been on the show. Uh, Joshua Colkins or Colchins, yes, Colchins, Joshua Colchins, Marty Max Ampero, and uh, Melinda Banks, who I I know quite well. The bearded uh, UFO guy, Gaz, Virginia Four, Y Duran, Bjorn Newhauser. Do you have the rest of the list there, Dave? Sure. Debbie Barlow, John Cook, KD, Steve Smith. That's an easy one. Yes. Thank um, you, Steve. This is Arlene Babka. And of course, uh, last but not least uh, in any way, uh, uh, Igor Stochik or Ihor, if I some, I believe that's the correct pronunciation of it, Ihor. Uh, Stochik, maybe it's Stochik. Listen, um, Igor, thank you. And we love we, our Patreon members. Thank you for subscribing, being loyal to our Patreon accounts. You're going to get all sorts of 
free content and uh and if you leave your name and, and sign on to our patreon then you uh we'll we'll call you out on air um and uh we'll get all sorts of cool stuff's gonna be happening yeah and getting you, a whole and new you, you, thing going on and you on can here. treat uh tom's home as an airbnb yes uh, that's <laughs> one of the things we'll be offering down the road that anyone, I, anyone yeah i wasn't aware of that but no he didn't know till just now but anyone who's on the patreon list can just go stay at tom's house anytime they like yes uh, i i've missed a meeting i think yeah but christina, that's a, is, a, christina uh, is a wonderful cook uh and she a, is and a great conversationalist uh, so you're is she have a fun is she su- does she is she supposed to she stay with the people yet. she doesn't oh. know about this yet either but yeah you're yeah, both gonna be yeah yeah that's you, part of the, the, the deal that you we stay with there. them okay yeah. Yeah. listen it seems like a good group i would uh yes. i'm i'm open let's just say and, i'm open yes and uh, your giant son luca uh will yes. will give uh piggyback rides to anyone, uh, who's, anyone who's staying in the house getting into a weird area but uh i'm, I'm just saying this you know we got, we're trying to make this worthwhile for people Tom. that's really i don't why are you fighting okay. me on this i'm I not i'm not i just feel like i've lost some of i don't know I feel I like just, I should be read in, or there's a memo somewhere that's important that I didn't read. Well, well no, okay. No, let's, well, listen. Stay on. Stay on the email chains. That's all I'm saying. Oh yeah, this is coming so from see, the email it. master himself, Dave Foley. I've, I've, I've never I, I met think, an email he's actually responded to. Yes. Okay. <laughs> or or read. To be fair. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've not. Right, I'm not. You know. Dave Schrader doesn't want to deal with this nonsense, and he doesn't no. want to hear our. Uh, internal squabbles because no, uh, he is the host of the mm-hmm. Paranormal 60 podcast and the lead investigator of Travel Channel and Discovery's acclaimed series, The Holes Are Files and Ghosts of Devil's Perch, uh, with appearances on Paranormal State, Ghost Adventures, and riveting documentaries like The Curse of Lizzie Borden and Demon in the White House. Dave has become a trusted authority on all things paranormal. From his earliest days, Dave has been immersed in a world of haunted houses, mysterious creatures, and intriguing UFO encounters. Uh, But he's not merely a bystander. He plunges headlong into the paranormal realm, investigating claims and traversing the most haunted locales across the globe. Uh, His new book is called Theater of the Mind, and we are really uh, fortunate to have him with us. Oh, look at that. That looks cool. You can... uh, order the uh, his book yeah he'll give you all we'll get you all the links and whatnot but let's bring on dave schrader himself sir so just i'm completing my patreon subscription <laughs> yes and thank you the third yeah. weekend in june tom i'm looking forward to staying at your bed and breakfast so thank it's, you listen uh, such, i just need to text yeah, really my wife quickly yeah, yeah it's yeah. gonna be great uh, oh don't worry i already did that i included the message right in there that okay. yeah, this was taking place and yeah. i'd like to thank chat gpt for that amazing biography you just read from it me. was beautiful i mean it <laughs> there. read like a dream i you yeah. know no problems at all with that and, yeah uh welcome and sir you, and don't forget thank your swimsuit you. when you're at tom's he has a lovely pool yeah suddenly we have yeah, to wear yeah. swimsuits when we swim yeah, piggybacks with my son it sounds all really <laughs> wholesome doesn't it like this yeah. is this is gone yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. has gone really well. suits awful. for the piggyback rides, but the swimming yeah. suit look, should be. Oh, you know. my dear. Oh, my yeah. Lord. I mean, look, as a massive young man. He's Very, a big fella. I mean, he, he can, can, he can pick anyone back, but I, don't, yeah. I feel a little, um, you know, awkward uh, volunteering him for yeah. such activities yeah. with strangers. But, you know, listen, we do what we can, can for bring our bring candy and puppies if it helps. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's yeah. How do we get How out of here? You? Yeah. Yeah, How are you, Dave? to you, please. I'm doing well. Thanks a lot for having me on, gentlemen. I appreciate this. Oh, well, this is great. No, we're, I, yeah. we're thrilled to have you. Um, well, I, I, I'll be I'm, back I again have... some other time. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> great. I had the pl- I had the pleasure of being on yours, your uh, yeah. your your YouTube channel and podcast a while back, which was fun. And of course, we know each other from the the world of of uh, fan festivals. Yes. 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 And uh, it's, you know, I've invited you many more times. If you'd read the emails, you would oh, know that you're always thank welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank I'll you. do that. Okay. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> little backup it never hurts. That. Oh, yeah. It yeah. I have no argument against that. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a good email reader. It's the envelope at the bottom of your screen um, should be to the left. But, uh, uh, and you, you know, click on that and have numbers. I get, and... over- I get overwhelmed by the 4,000 DNC emails I get every day. <laughs> Uh, because because I contributed to Hillary Clinton's campaign. Yes. And if you unsubscribe, though, it's true. It never works. I, I mean, the amount of time one spends unsubscribing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dave. Uh, okay. Well, just just for your knowledge, Dave, yes. uh, 
I did find out that you can get unsubscribed from the DNC and Hillary's only foot website simply by clicking the unsubscribe at the bottom of that email. Really? Well, I'm going to try then. Yeah. I, try. I feel like I've tried everything. I, well, of course, you gave up a I've long tried, time ago. The main thing I've tried is not opening my email. <laughs> that, well, that works for you, but yeah, then you yeah. miss everybody else. He's doing yeah. that terrific. He's handling that yeah. part yeah. of He's it talk, very yeah. well. Yeah, my um, managers and agents don't like it either. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk the paranormal here. I ha yes. you, First of all, you cover a broad swath of the, you're you're out in the field. You're yes. doing uh excellent interviews. Um and I'm curious what what okay, what starts this for you? Was there a personal experience? Was there was it just you somehow stumbled yeah. into this phenomenon? Where where does it start for you, sir? This Dave Schrader is a little boy. And yeah, and it was. I, there. I was maybe about three, three and a half, and the ghost of my grandmother would visit me when I would go spend the night at my grandparents' house. Oh. And my mom thought this was just my brain's way of trying to process grieving, and I was very close with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, and my grandparents slept on separate ends of the house. They loved each other very much, but my grandfather snored like a, a glass going through a chipper shredder. And mm -hmm. so I would sleep in her room when I would go to visit, and uh, I would you know, my mom would come pick me up and I would talk about how grandma read to me last night or these things. And it, it just would happen all the time. And then once I got very specific, mom was telling me, you know, uh, honey, we've talked about this grandma's in heaven. And I said, I know. And she misses us. And she was wearing a silly dress with dots on it. And she didn't have all of her teeth. And my mom was like, that's oddly weird and specific. And she mentions it to my aunt in passing, and my aunt still lived at my grandfather's house at the time. She was just barely out of teenage years. And my aunt's jaw hit the floor because my grandmother had died uh, dealing with cirrhosis and an aneurysm. She didn't look like herself. So they had done a closed casket. Only three people knew what my grandmother were buried in. And that was my aunt who picked up the outfit, my grandfather who took it to the mortician and the mortician himself. And I described to a T the dress, the necklace, and the fact that they had, in fact, removed her false teeth for burial. And when my aunt heard that, her jaw just hit the floor. And then she confided in my mom. She had received a phone call from my grandmother after her passing as well. Oh, so it's always yeah. been part of my my life, this mm -hmm. supernatural. And 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 other family members too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember the? Do you remember that? You. I mean, of course, because sometimes we tell stories and we remember. We hear about the stories and sort of think. What do you right. yourself have a memory of that? Not at all. And I'm very open with the fact I'm a skeptical believer. I believe because I've had experiences, but I also question my own experiences, wanting to understand what really takes place. So I have. I'm so disassociated from that. Uh, moment. I have only heard it through the telling from my mom and my my uh, aunt. And I had other experiences throughout my life. And I grew up in Medina, Illinois. Couldn't be any more white bread town in any city in the world. But I grew up there and we had a very haunted little ranch style house. No clue why it was haunted. Never felt any kind of threatening or malevolent, but you could definitely hear footsteps when you were downstairs. You'd hear somebody walking around, talking, and you'd go upstairs and there'd be nobody there and you'd settle down. And then you could hear people downstairs. So it was always just just weird combination. And, and my mom and aunt were kind of two of the main people in my lives, and they never shut that down. They were always reading mm -hmm. some Stephen King book or Hans Holzer or Ed and Lorraine Warren, and they were very open about the high strangeness in the world around us. So when I had questions, it was always just tackled without it being taboo. Which is great. That's, I mean, I think yeah. that's, you know, it leaves leaves one open and, and um, – you know, I, yes, I was kind of a susceptible, not susceptible, I mean, I, I think because, well, I think we're just all kids are, you know, and it's just that, but mm -hmm. that can easily get sort of shut down. I think all kids are sort of open to that. Um, and, and so was that, um, were you, as you're, as you're growing up thinking like, I want to engage with this in my life, or is that something that was kind of there but you had other pursuits or was this like i really want to find out what's going on never as a youngster did i want to figure out the the big questions it was just always oh this is cool what there was a ghost there there was this sighting there was that and there were just enough weird things that would happen throughout my life i mean we were, i was driving with my friend rick one day and we were both maybe 17 18 years old it's a beautiful blue sky day and we're driving past this old church near roselle illinois and as we're just talking, 
a lightning bolt hits the cross on the top of the church, clear blue skies. And it hit and we were mid talk and we're like, yeah, but it. and we just kept driving. He goes, did you just see that? And I go, the lightning bolt hit the church. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's blue skies. There's not a cloud above. And we just both watch this bolt of lightning strike the church. I have no understanding that, but it's always been just enough things to keep me interested in, in realizing there's something much bigger going on than just the life that everybody gets up, puts on their pants, brushes their teeth, eats their breakfast, goes to work, wash, rinse, repeat. So I've been fascinated in keeping my eyes open, my ears peeled, and just trying to live in these little magic moments in between life. I'm curious. It was like you mentioned that your, your aunt was, um, uh, oh, is that like an American aunt? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that your aunt was uh, was also had uh, uh, an encounter with your your dead grandmother. Mm -hmm. Is is there is there are there, are there more sort of incidents of, of with her and your grandmother or other uh, sort of paranormal incidents of other family members? Aside from you know a, a couple of dream visitations to my aunt, nothing else besides that phone call. My aunt had another very interesting. Uh, element. And I talk about this in my book too, is it not this specific story, but the concept of time slip phenomena. And my aunt was uh, living at my grandfather's home after my grandmother passed away. And my grandfather was a construction worker in Chicago. And he would uh, come home usually, maybe eat real quick and then head up to the Shamro's uh, tavern at the corner to have a couple of, of libations. And then he would come home and she'd hear him pull into the driveway and the keys hit the counter and he'd grab himself some water and then go to bed. And she heard all this the one night and uh, heard the, the bed creak in his room. And then the phone rang and she reached over and picked up the phone and it was my grandfather. And he said, Hey, I don't want you to be worried. I'm going to stay at the Shamro's a little later tonight. And she's like, very funny, dad. And he's like, what do you mean? And she said, I just heard you come in and go to your room. And he goes, I'm not joking, Judy. I'm still at the Shamro's. And he held the phone up so people, hey, you know. And my aunt's blood just ran cold. Uh, my grandfather hurried home quickly thinking there might be an intruder. And there was no one there. But to me, that was this time slip phenomena. These things, what we would call a residual haunting if my grandfather were dead, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just something that's matter of fact, nothing major about it. But I think that we're haunting ourselves in many instances, those footsteps you hear going up the stairs at night or the voices that call out your name that, you know, was that, was that my kid calling my name? And then you go upstairs and your kid's not there. I think we're in a place where, you know, where we're all sitting right now has always existed in time and space. It's been many different things, but it's always existed. And on each day is another page of that book. And sometimes we just see through those pages and we have those experiences and we witness something that is not entirely ghostly, but it is definitely something out of time. And I think we're short-sighted if we think all hauntings are taking place from the past. Those bangings on the wall you may hear at night may not be from the past. It may be the family that's moved in 30 years from now that are remodeling the house at that time. That's mm -hmm. cool. Is yeah. this, it, you mentioned, uh, time sl is that the is that the overall theme of theater of the mind or what 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 is this book what what is its kind of uh purpose is it a compilation of best stories or you tell us what's well in in theater of the mind i've i've got a great little combination of stories that i've, I've collected over the years from listeners and followers uh many of them have sent in their stories and they're like i you know i just want somebody to hear my story share it don't tell my name you know i'm an attorney or i'm a president i mean uh, uh somebody <laughs> else and they're just very cautious with what they allow out and what is to be shared. So some of the stories, I've just changed their names with their permission, but their stories are their stories. And I thought it was a nice way to take a, a wide swath, everything from the very first story about JFK being a time slip story to a haunted hospital that I was involved in, a, a ghost uh, haunting a doll that was one of my personal stories. But then there's a story of a changeling in Ireland. There's a story of a doppelganger. There is a story of aliens, another story of UFOs. Uh, you know, so there's a really good mixture of different style stories. And I didn't want it to just be a ghost storybook or mm -hmm. aliens or Bigfoot. 
I, I think it's interesting to see the book individually for each story. And then as you step away, you can kind of see how there's so many different commonalities and threads that run through these type of experiences that I think we may limit ourselves by trying to compartmentalize the experience itself. That ghosts fit here, Bigfoot hit fits there, UFOs fit here. I think there's a lot more to what's going on around us that ties it all together. No, I agree. I think that's something that uh, when we had George Knapp on a while back, he talked Name about dropper. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's another one. Um, <laughs> he was saying that George that about that uh, James Lakatsky, who ran OSAP, the you know, mm -hmm. who came to the conclusion after after you know studying, you know, go, setting out to study UAP, but by the end of their their research, he came back with that you can't you can't study UAP or UFOs without also studying the paranormal because in his view after years of looking at all the data it's all the same thing it's all overlapped and it's all intertangled um so i mean is that sort of how you're feeling about it all now that it's that what we're we're basically looking at uh i guess a weave of of reality that is one that that maybe isn't as simple as we think it is Right. And here's the, the brilliance and beauty of it all. Do you remember in, I think it was like the late nineties, all the rage were these goofy pictures you'd see at malls that were just wavy lines and weird patterns. And if you'd stand there long enough and kind of let your eyes gently cross all of a sudden, there's the kids in the hall popping out yeah. of this picture or the yes. statue of Liberty or something. Right. And you'd be I like myself migraines making, doing those back of those days. Right. Yes. It, but, it, but it's there and it shows you just how vulnerable our perception of reality is, is that by looking at this picture on the whole, it's nothing but squiggly lines. By allowing yourself to kind of become part of it into the tapestry itself, a story unfolds. And that sounds all woo-woo and tree-huggery, I know, but it's true. Look, I mean, that was a perfect example of of how we can perceive different things and why some people do not have paranormal experiences and others may. Because how many times did you stand there next to your friend who's like, yep, Statue of Liberty. Oh, that's the lion from the, you know, the Wizard of Oz. And you're mm -hmm. crossing your eyes and getting closer and backing away. And you can't see what they're seeing. Doesn't mean that it's not real. It just means that you perceive things in a different way, in a different light, in a different yes. texture than other people do. And some people may have more facility for adjusting their their point of view, I guess. Exactly. Or their, you know, right. Um because uh, oh, I forgot the question I was going to ask. Somebody else talk. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think we had started this whole idea of like, because Dave had, you know, been kind of looking into the UAP issue and making, you know, uh, friends and, and contacts with people who were, you know, in government or in the military, you know, and it was, we were like going to talk about this, yeah. you know, that was what we were, yeah. we were going to figure but this, we, th figure this yeah. out. And then slowly, we but surely. More of the par yeah, I'm sorry, go on. You were Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, it's just, it, it, it just, you start to, you know, drift this way and that with the uh, just vexing uh, weirdness of it all. And I, you know, I was always, I was open, like you had early childhood kind of ghost experiences yes. yeah. lived in a house that seemed, um, not seemed, I mean, I'm, I'll lay it down. That house was it haunted. Was haunted. Um, yeah. yeah haunt, Tom's haunting is, was, is pretty extreme. Yeah. It, it, it's, I, I mean, I, I'm open into, and I have found, you mentioned immersing or getting, you know, kind of if you sort of dive into this subject and the picture becomes clearer, mm -hmm. I'm wondering how literal that is because I feel an uptick in weirdness since having, you know, now 50 conversations about this in an organized fashion as opposed to before. I have really had moments where I went, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is getting a little like intense, you know? Um, and I'm curious uh, if you've had that happen to you. I mean, you're much, and you, you look, you've been out there. You, I want to talk to you about investigating haunted houses and all. That's like my, sure. that's like my dream job. But, um, but tell me what I mean. Do you feel that? Do you feel like, oh, I'm exposing myself to this this phenomenon? And yeah, I think the more you open yourself up to it, the more it becomes uh, prevalent. It's like, all right, you, I always use this excuse, but it. it is seems to be something universal. 
Uh, I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan. So I went out to buy myself a PT Cruiser one day because I love that old 1930s aesthetic looking like an old gangster car. And I get there and they're out of black and they're out of silver and they've got purple left. And I'm like, no, I'm a Vikings fan. That's pretty cool. Nobody else has got a purple PT Cruiser. Everybody's got black, white, and silver. So I buy a purple PT Cruiser and the way home, I see 20 purple PT Cruisers. It's because now my awareness, right? And my mnemonic mm-hmm. trigger has been right. ignited and I see, and I'm more aware of these things. Yes. Um, I think they call that attention bias. Right. Yes. So you, you start to become more aware of the things that you're watching, right? What's the old saying that if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. And I firmly believe that. And I love the the hippiness of this concept that uh, all of these little things happen in those spaces in between life in, in those moments when you least expect, we have these really resounding, amazing experiences and we're uh, relaxed or we're in a different heightened state and something allows itself to be witnessed. And I think that's really a compelling aspect of, of all of what's going on. So when I'm, investigating or or opening myself up to this i realized that okay going in dave schrader i'm not a medium i can go to a very haunted location like i did in um uh, you know the ghosts of devil's perch tv show we stayed in butte montana for almost four months solid and we were steeped in that environment so if you take a paper clip it itself is not magnetized But if you take it to a giant magnet and rub it against that magnet for a minute or two, you can now take that paperclip over to other paperclips and they'll daisy chain two or three or four of them, right? Mm -hmm. And it's temporary and it'll eventually, the the magnetism will fade. Well, a lot of what we believe is going on is electromagnetic fields, both in UFO technology, in in, uh, alien visitations, ghost visitations. So if I'm in a location long enough, I might start to resonate at that same kind of magnetism. And then when I go somewhere else, I'm more prone to having those experiences because I've I've kind of become one with that force, if you will. And I think that that's what lends so many people that are into this on a regular basis, better access to that kind of communication. And when I had my UFO experience, In 2006, at the end of it, James Gilliland looked at me and he said, now that they know you're watching, they'll be watching you. Yeah. Tell us about your experience. Yeah. While we're on the subject. Yeah. Tell us about what happened. Uh, I I was driving home one night and it was late at night. I just started my podcast, my original paranormal podcast, and I'm listening to Coast to Coast AM. And George Norrie is talking to this guy called uh, uh, James Gilliland. And he owns this property in Trout Lake, Washington, known as the Assetti Ranch. And he's talking about the UFO activity and the volcano that opens up and UFO craft fly into it. It's so absurd and insane. Every story he tells is more bizarre than the one before it. But the clincher for me at the end was, and if you come here on a clear night and everyone's invited, you have a 90 to 95% chance of seeing activity over my property. (laughs) Within 30 days, I'm on his front door Mm -hmm. and I just went and I didn't go into, uh, I didn't want him knowing I'm coming. I didn't want anything set up. And there were other people there as well. And I got there and James greeted me very kindly. And he's, he looks like, um, Grizzly Adams. For those of you that uh, have any memory of the seventies TV, a big strapping fellow, long hair, and he's just telling me what's going on. And of course the first night I'm there, it's overcast. So the skies are not giving anything. And as we're talking and he's pointing to this Mount Adams, I believe it is the, uh, the dormant volcano, <clears throat> there's lights pulsating inside the cloud. And, and I'm thinking, all right, science tells me there's going to be atmospheric change and pressure. And we're probably seeing some kind of weather anomaly. Uh, he's telling me, no, that's the UFOs. That's what they're doing. You're able to see this stuff. And I'm still like, eh, eh. Or it's a weather anomaly and, you know, natural gas is going up and striking the clouds that are mm-hmm. dense with moisture, right. uh, being all Mr. Science, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. And the second night I go out there and we have this beautiful clear night and I start watching these grains of sand move across the sky and then bank at strange 
angles and take off and stop and then go again. And he had those laser pointers, those green army military grade laser pointers. And this was after 9-11. And if you remember, there were people that were getting in a lot of trouble for aiming those yeah. little laser pointers mm-hmm. red and green at airplanes. Uh, and he was not far from a military base. So he's painting the sky with these lasers, pointing things out, and he'd hit one and it would stop moving. And then all of a sudden it would start pulsing at him and then it would take off and skeptic or not, you got to be thinking, well, this is the worst spy vehicle on planet earth. If this is Russia, they're like, Oh, hello, comrade. Good to see you too. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Let's pulse at him. It's insane. So I'm watching this, just trying to wrap my head around this. And the second uh, third night I go back out there, we'd spent the first night watching Mount Adams region in the sky. And that sky is gorgeous. It's like the, the screen behind me. Just I've never seen a sky so vibrant and beautiful. And you could actually see the ribbon of the Milky Way. And I just watched the sky in complete and utter amazement. And what's also very startling is how through all these billions of stars, you begin to detect movement. And you can see these little grains of sand shooting around. And I, you know, I'm still questioning what I'm experiencing. But at one point I walk out into the field and I turn around and I face James and his house and all that property. And I'm looking, thinking, what am I missing this way? We've all right. been focused over here. Maybe the real light shows back here. I sit out there for about an hour and he had these tall groves of pine trees. And this thing came, comes flying out from behind the trees. And it looks like a stingray, not a plane, but the, the, water creature Mm -hmm. and it's fluttering across the sky and it's glowing blue it was so absurd looking that it was like a 1980s music video effect like very early 80s distance Mm -hmm. are you from this object in your mind maybe i'm maybe 100 yards away from this thing and it's about the size of my hand at that size watching it flutter out from behind the trees and take off so i do the one thing i never saw coming i start running towards it And as I'm running towards it, I'm keeping my eyes open. Now, mind you, I have a phone with a camera, although 2006, it's a flip phone with a two megapixel picture. So it would have Mm -hmm. been nothing that would have been seen. But I I wanted to keep my eyes on this thing. And it was fast. I mean, it moved through. But I'm grabbing rocks up off the ground and I'm chucking them between the trees, waiting to hear as it hits a screen that he has up there, right? Figuring this guy's ruin with us and there's nothing and i walk between those trees and i'm lobbing rocks and pine cones and there's nothing and i go walking back and james is just standing there all chill and it's very dark out and you know just beautiful and he goes what'd you see and i explained to him what i saw and without missing a beat he goes yes those are half biological half mechanical craft the skins on them allow them to get in between dimensions now mind you i just saw this i have no better explanation (laughs) and i looked at him like what drugs are you on yeah and i had no other way to ascertain what it was i saw make any sense of it and the the real twist for me was this part i uh at the end of the night i drive down the hill i go to bed in the little trout lake motel it's this beautiful little cabiny hotel and uh I, I go to bed and i'm 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 on the road all the time like dave and i'm i'm locking my door and i latch it and i chain it and i bolt it and i go to bed and i wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of thumping like somebody running in my room and i hear my door slam and i get up i'm like what the hell and i get up and look and sure enough the 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 chain is swinging back and forth on the on the oh, door goodness. and my door is unlocked and opened so I'm looking, oh, did somebody break in? How do, and then I'm like, well, how'd they get past the chain and the little bolt? I can't fathom what's just happened. In talking to James a day later, he goes, well, you spent three days watching them. I think maybe they just came to watch you, which was real unsettling. It sounds all <laughs> beautiful. Fair, and, but only oh, fair. Right. But yeah. yeah. Uh, it's weird. The, the, the thing you saw sounds uh, alarmingly like the the creature in Nope. Did you? you know, to a degree, right? Yeah. Um, and that's a great movie. If anybody has still not seen Nope, check it out. I but, have not yet. Wow, Tom. I know. I'm are a you well, what kind of show you're hosting here? I'm go. I'm trying. I'm Why don't working you on just it. take yourself off screen and <laughs> I'm the novice the here. Watch I'm, the movie right now. I'm <laughs> yeah. Joe Q. Public trying to get get <laughs> hip to what's happening in the world here. Yeah. Um, that is, so. What what is the name of this ranch again? Where is it? Yeah, because I think I want to visit. They still yes. get. 
Was it? Yeah, Sorry, you can on. still get there. It's E C E T I E C E T I. And I don't remember what that stands for, but go to E C E T I dot O R G. That's his website. And he's always hosting some kind of an event there. So you can you can go and you're welcome and you make donations. Um, you can stay there on the property. Oh, you, me. Camp. And uh, you, yeah. <laughs> you said, Mon- is it Montana? No, it's uh, Trout Lake, Washington. Trout Lake, Washington. Washington. Yeah, so it's not far from Oregon. It's right yeah. over, uh, right over the border, basically, and you're right there. So it and it was, was he- really a remarkable experience. Yes, yeah. and so you got, and you also got a little bit of what of what they what the folks over at uh, Skinwalker called the hitchhiker effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is and- that? Yeah, which for people who don't know, that's the notion that when you when you view. Uh, a UAP sighting when you're exposed to these things, uh, that often you will, uh, be followed by other extraordinary events. Yes. Uh, that weird things will just start happening. Uh, you know, like people that have been to skinwalker have, you know, weird, uh, cryptids, uh, seven foot tall, uh, uh, wool bipedal wolves showing up in their, in their yards or, or uh, blue spheres showing up in their children's bedroom. Uh, so weird things like that. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's an astounding place. If you get a chance and I've recommended it to so many people, only one TV show that I'm aware of took me up on it. And it was paranormal state. Uh, the kids from paranormal state back in the Mm -hmm. day, uh, Ryan Buell and the kids, they used to go out demon hunting every week on their TV show, facing off against some other creepy, immortal creature. Right. And one day Ryan and the kids call me and they're like, uncle Dave. So this UFO ranch you keep talking about. Uh, how serious are you about your experiences? I'm like, dude, I'm dead serious. And we just came back again. I went there with two of my other friends because I wanted to show them. And we had a crazy experience there. And as we're chatting about it, uh, Ryan goes, well, we'd like to go there and do a, a paranormal state field trip episode. And would you like to join us? I'm like, yes, I would. Let's do this. So I'm on, I think it's season two. It's an episode called First Contact. And you can watch mm-hmm. it on the Max streaming service and Discovery Plus, I believe. Uh, but it's called Paranormal State. And it was we had a great time, and we caught some amazing things on film uh, that were really kind of astounding just to, to be there. But if I could tell real quickly, my yeah. one of my favorite stories, when I got to the SETI Ranch the next time, it was like over the 4th of July weekend, and it was this huge hippie festival he had going on. And uh, I went there with two of my friends. And when we first rolled up, there's beautiful clouds sprinkled in the sky and there's this one cloud and I've got to dig up the picture. I'll send it to you guys. And it's so funny. Cause you know, they tell you all oh, the, the UFOs hide in those lenticular clouds. And sometimes I'm like, this is a bit of a stretch that they're hiding in clouds, but there is a perfectly formed 1950s saucer type UFO cloud just hovering in the sky. And it's, it's got the dome and everything. It mm-hmm. looks like a 1950s UFO, but it's a cloud clouds above it are moving clouds below it are moving it's sitting there. And I'm just staring at this thing, talking with my friend. And I go, that is the craziest. If those are aliens trying to hide, they are the dumbest <laughs> aliens. And as I say that this black ball starts undulating at the bottom of the cloud, something's moving within the cloud. And I turned yeah. and I looked at her and I go, did you just see that? And she goes, yeah, there was like humps or uh, like a black ball dropped out of that cloud. And I'm like, yeah. And we just stood there completely blown away we're in a field of hundreds of hippies. Nobody's paying attention to this cloud. And we saw this thing take place. So as the day progresses, clouds are filling the sky. And I go to James Gilliland. I go, dude, I think we're in for a disappointment tonight. You got a whole field of hippies and there's no sky to watch. And he goes, no, I I talked to my friends. It'll be clear over our property. Mm -hmm. It'll be clear over our property. Okay, James. And hand to God. The clouds filled the entire sky, and there was this giant football stadium-sized hole in the clouds above us. And and who are these friends he talked to? Uh, uh, the aliens. They yes. Just, okay. So, yeah. So, so well, that he was he my was question. Yeah. He said, communication. He had mentioned yeah. there was the skin and the half biological, half uh, you know, right. drone or whatever. I mean, did he specify how? Did he specify how he was communicating with? they made themselves known to him all the time. They just were there and he communes with them and talks to them and they commune with, 
I have no other explanation. Like I said, as absurd as it sounds, I can't give you a better rationale for what he says is going on because he says the sky is going to remain clear over my property. And there is a giant circular hole in the clouds above his property. And as we're watching it through the night and the hippies start going to sleep, the cloud coverage keeps getting smaller and, but it's still a perfect circle in the sky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we get to the point where there's about 12 of us and we're looking up and we're all suffering from Pez neck, as I call it at this point, because mm-hmm. all our heads are flipped back for hours. And at one point I looked down and I go, can you, this is amazing how the more people have gone down for the night and the intention is gone from watching the skies, how this hole has just slowly closed. And with that, we all look up and there's no hole in the sky. It's completely blanketed in clouds. The minute mm-hmm. we stopped watching it, it filled in. I cannot explain it for the life of me. You know, maybe there's uh, cloud coverage that does that. Maybe this is a normal effect. I've never seen it or witnessed it in my many years of life. Doesn't mean that it doesn't actually happen, but I love it. I think that was one of the coolest moments I've ever had. I saw something undulating in a UFO shaped cloud and I watched cloud coverage close itself in at night Mm -hmm. and then like a light switch just turned itself off when everybody stopped paying attention to it. I want to go. Chrissy, yeah, me. <laughs> this is a field trip that we need yeah. to figure out yeah. because that sounds that sounds amazing, and, and yeah. I've, you know, yeah. I think some of these these places do exist that are these. Yes, yeah, you know, Skidwalker the, Ranch is not alone, and right, the membrane is thin, and some of these locate you know locations, and people are you know for whatever reason it's spilling out, uh, it, it, you know, in these areas, and that's um, that's that is totally wild. Uh, no. I will say this, though. Again, the skeptical side of me kicks in. It is relatively near to a military facility, I think less than 100 or 200 miles away. Mm -hmm. So, But there's also photographs, or there used to be on his... And you can go to YouTube as well. Type in ECETI Ranch or ECETI UFOs, and there used to be littered with videos of UFOs, and you'd see this thing go screeching across the sky and all these black helicopters going after it. Uh, So... Is it military? Is it, again, yeah. if it's military and we're painting the sky with 30 green military grade laser pointers and it stops, I'm sure without a doubt that if we were doing that to military personnel, there would have been a convoy coming to arrest oh, yeah. a whole bunch yeah. of hippies. Yeah. yeah. Jeeps would have been, Jeeps would have shown up. Pretty oh, quickly. no doubt. And three yeah. times there, never once did anything show up uh, that would say that military was behind it. No, and and the, and the location of a military. I mean, it does seem like military bases seem to attract this kind of sure. activity. I was going to say, yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of the weirdest stuff that's and the most the, the most documented stuff is coming from military bases and from military right. observers. So obviously, there's a something you know something about those installations is attracting phenomena. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah. I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm and, all about it. And uh, it is, it's, it's amazing, but it makes you wonder, is it, is it some kind of super technology we're working on? Uh, is the reason that it's stopping and reacting to our laser pointers is because it's an unmanned drone of some sort. So we're not blinding the pilots. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different uh, speculation that goes along with it, but yeah. until I can get full answers, I can't, I, I can't just dismiss it. We, at one point I'm watching this. It was maybe the size of like, um, I don't know, like a thumbtack size light moving through the sky. And James hands me these like third gen night vision goggles. And I flip them up to look at the sky and I go, holy shit. And he goes, what? And I said, that's not one light. And I hand it to him. And it was this massive triangle, massive triangle going over us but you could see the stars, Mm -hmm. but there was just the tip had a light to it and it was moving across. And I'm like, ha. And I put the goggles back up and look. And when you're looking through the night vision goggles, you cannot see the stars. You just see this black craft moving silently across the sky. Yeah. But to the naked eye, the stars. Yeah. The stars and one light shining light. And that was it. Wow. That is crazy. Where do you get, where do you, I mean, where do you hear, how do you find your stories? 
I mean, what is what's your? I mean, obviously, some come yeah. to you now because you you know you're you're known and you're uh, an expert on this stuff. But what what other well, methods wanna, do you? I don't want to brag, but I am a Golden Telly Award winning international TV sensation of paranormal programs. But there that's you beside go. The point. Uh, Are you no. sure you didn't want to brag? <laughs> No, hey, look, I'm well having flexed. a T-shirt made up with that. I don't, yeah, I just think it's <laughs> that's a it's lot not of so words. Much bragging as it is just making sure you understand. Yeah, we know. I am so that you don't think I'm nuts. That's why you're <laughs> here. That would be weird <laughs> if I was making those claims without it being on my T-shirt. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of it was like that night, coast to coast. I just happened to listen. The guy throws out, "You're right. welcome here. Anybody's welcome." Clear night, ninety to ninety-five percent chance. Honestly, if I told you guys. There's a 90, 95% chance that on this specific night, if we go to the Ford Theater, we're going to see Abraham Lincoln's ghost. You would go, even if you thought Dave's nuts, yeah. but you would go if I said, I'm telling you guys, it's a 90 to 94. That's a, such a huge, huge portion to, to offer. So I just went yeah. and, and I've always thought I didn't want to just be the guy behind the mic talking about these things. I lived through so many weird experiences. I want to go. And if you tell me this is taking place, I'll go put myself in that position and see if I can prove it to myself. Is it really happening? And there have been very few places that have let me down uh, in in the you know categories of, of high strangeness. But for the most part, I've had some really, really cool moments. And I want to say, and you're uh, also like you you were joking about like Dave's crazy. What I, I think, you, first of all, your you know your interviews are great. Your show's great. It's just Thank such you. a great energy. And um, but you also, I mean, I respect you. Challenge some guests that if you mm -hmm. kind of smell bullshit, you kind of call bullshit. It's a it's an interesting thing because I mean we we try to we we don't really we don't do that so much on this show because it's sort of but it's it's tricky sometimes you're like you know you're listening you're like okay how what how do you um you know how, how do you gauge that how do you gauge sincerity in terms of who's on your show are you it's you a lot easier now that i do video programs like this because i can i can watch and as i see dave describing this experience of bigfoot stealing his basket when he was you know, at a picnic, I can gauge, is he doing it tongue in cheek or is there a sincerity? It was a lot harder when I just used to do the show over the radio and talking on coast. I was a fill in host for five years on coast to coast AM. And sometimes you can't read the audience, but the one main thing that I took away from it was I never judge the story. I allow it to just breathe because some of the most ridiculous sounding stories to me, I would, you know, Dave Foley calls in from Canada to tell me this story, and it's ridiculous. It's about these giant frog-like creatures uh, that are known to do this, that, and the other. And my, you know, my producer and I are rolling our eyes at each other. Okay, Dave, thanks a lot. Two days later, I get an email going, I want you to know, Dave, I have been on the cusp of suicide two or three times in my life because I've seen those same creatures, and I thought I was nuts. I thought I was completely insane. And now that I know somebody else has had this experience, so I, I've stopped judging so much just because it doesn't fit my lexicon or understanding of the world. And I've allowed that to be. But I also find that if you're talking to a guest who has good fun energy and they're playing with you, Dave could tell me that story and I'll go, and just out of curiosity, were there edibles involved, Dave? <laughs> no, mm -hmm. no. I wish yeah. there were, but, and then you can just, ha it's, it's my way of politely saying, it sounds like bullshit and giving him an out. And then letting the, the audience know, I'm with you. I know how nuts this sounds. And yeah, but sometimes those are the most fun and engaging moments I've had. I had this woman, I get this press release and this woman had come into contact uh, with the devil incarnate in human form. And she had had this weird kind of relationship with the devil for years and this PR person should have been given some kind of a, an award because it was so beautifully written so I invite this woman on the show and she is such a sweetheart and we laughed together throughout the entire show because she understood how insanely absurd everything she said was she got it but she stuck to her story which made me love her and believe her even more because she met the devil through an ad in the penny saver because she was looking for a dance partner to go to clubs and she didn't want to go alone. And I said, well, it's good to know that the economy is so rough that even the devil has to put an ad in the penny saver. And she, we laughed about that. When I knew I had her then, I knew we could play this little cat and mouse game. And throughout the entire story, as more 
absurdities would unfold and the fact that he lived in a double wide trailer in Arkansas. Of course he did. And he had his mm-hmm. concubines stayed in their little trailers on his property. It was more and more bizarre, but she just she put him in his place. I'm not going to sleep with you. And when I, I just like to dance with you. So this is what we're going to do. So the devil would just dance with her and go have sex with the other concubines. But it was such a charming story. And for a hundred percent of me believes she believes every word she just told me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is a good Stephen King short story. I mean, I'm, I'm liking oh, that. I love the, yeah. I love yeah. the, like, you know, I'll just the dance the with you. De- yeah. yeah. I'll just dance with you devil. Right. Um, it is. They, and you know what, but there is that, there's that, weirdness that almost protects the phenomenon from exposure where it's like someone's story just it's there there is no logic there's there's right. so odd um and yeah, yeah we're we're left to kind of just accept i mean it seems like everyone what's becoming clear to me is that everyone has some firsthand or secondhand contact with the weird the mysterious the unknown that is um that makes it far more ubiquitous than i ever realized you know it feels like something um that was you know private to me you know it's it's just very but the moment you push a little someone's got someone's got a story um i was curious and and the more you do this the more you'll hear people go tom dave i love your show i listen all the time it is the funniest show i can't believe you guys believe all these morons you have on your show they're so ridiculous but when I was a kid and then they launched into their own story, it's so dismissive of everybody and everything. But let me tell you about my one experience. So I find yeah. that people, it's a protection that they throw up, that they're trying to shield yeah. themselves from your scorn. By, I look, right. I'm much too intelligent to fall yeah, for right, everything right. else. Yeah. I'm but not crazy. My experience. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely, I know it's like, as soon as I started talking about these sort of things publicly, like I was startled by the number of people who would reach out to me that I, people, some people I'd known for years who had weird experiences and you know at the time i had not had any experiences like you know i mean i did eventually attract a ufo to, into my life by talking too much um but yeah there, the, there was just so many people who um have these experiences and and for so long don't want to talk about it all right you know like there's, there's that notion you know there's that misconception that people uh the people who, who want to talk about UFOs is because, oh, they just really want to believe and they want to have seen a UFO and it's zero, you know, and so, they, you know, it's a fantasy because it's something they really want to be true. And almost everyone I've ever met fights like, the, like, a, like a dog against it, you know, right. do everything in their power to think of some other explanation for what they saw. And then they keep it a secret for as long as they can and only tell a handful of people because they don't want to be mocked. They don't want right. to be and, dismissed. And that's a lot of the sincerity I see in people that tell me their stories and they relate these tales to me. And I can see in their eyes that this is this is just as real as that favorite Christmas morning for you, that that memory. And I always I'm always really um, kind of touched by when people decide to open up to me and share these these experiences and uh, stories, because, you know, sometimes that is their deep, dark secret. That is their. I just want you to tell me if I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people, you can say it's it. shame from right. From these exactly. Yeah. And it's so cool. But I, I do want to thank you, Dave Foley, because one of my favorite surreal moments in my life ever was being at uh, one of the conferences with you and you invited me over. We, we met down at the bar and you said, Hey, I've got some friends joining me. Would you like to come have a drink? And sure. So I get to sit down and there's Todd Stashwick from 12 Monkeys and Star Trek Picard and Harry fucking Hamlin walks over (laughs) and we're talking ghosts and UFOs and Bigfoot. And it was just like this surreal moment of, holy, it's everybody. This has touched everybody's (laughs) life. It was so cool. And I love that Harry Hamlin drops this like 20 minute ghost story on us and then as we're talking about Bigfoot, he's like, I'm up in the high Sierras by myself all the time. Why doesn't Bigfoot attack me? And why are like, he was almost pissed that Bigfoot wouldn't acknowledge him. And and then he's like, yeah. And then he's like, well, I'm going to bed. And he just walks away. It was just like this great (laughs) moment of surreal nature. So I I do have to thank you. That was, that was a fun fun night. I really liked that night too. It was a great conversation. Are there any topics you won't touch Dave? 
I am not a big fan of most conspiracy theories. Um, Mm -hmm. And you think that's kind of strange in this element, but you know, I think part of it is just for my own sanity. I, I understand that our government does horrible things and sometimes in the name of what they believe to be the greater good, I don't want to know just how dark and deep that well is. So it's my own way of just trying to keep, I'm, I'm prone to depression and anxiety in my life already. Uh, and I have 11 children and eight grandchildren. Uh, the last thing in the world I want to do is sweat more. So, 11 children. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, okay. and yes, I'm aware how that happens. Yeah. That, that's that's why you're on the road so much. <laughs> oh, <but not. laughs> that explains it. Honey, I'm um, pregnant. I got to go. Yeah. Look at the time. So, conspiracies <laughs> weird me out. Um, but I'm, you know, some I'm fascinated by. Uh, I, I actually. Oh, through the good graces. I got a call one day when I was hosting my old radio show and uh, this publicist goes, Hey, um, Judith Barry Baker is in the twin cities and she knows your show and she would like to come in and sit with you and talk to you about the JFK assassination. And I I'm oh, whatever. Another story about the JFK assassination. She goes, well, Judith Barry Baker was the lover of Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm, wow. Now I'm a little bit more peaked yeah. because this is a firsthand acknowledgement And I want to know how, and it's not over the phone. She wants to come into your studio and she wants to meet with you. And I'm like, okay. And I had her come into the studio and she sat down with this huge tome of, of a scrapbook. She had collected photographs of her and Lee, uh, time cards from the, the organization they worked with. Uh, and if you're familiar with Dr. Mary's monkey and that story, Lee Harvey Oswald worked at that lab. So did Judith Very Baker. And, she tells this story, and at the end of the story, I firmly believe Lee Harvey Oswald did not pull the trigger in the JFK assassination. I believe that he got wind of it, and as a good patriot, tried to tell the president what was happening, went to his superiors, and he came back to Judith Barry Baker and said, I just signed my death warrant. They're going to kill the president, and I'm going to take the hit for this. Um, and she, she knew days in advance. Now, it's always easy to tell a story after the fact. There are some other compelling things for a guy who hated America. When they arrested him, he was wearing his uh, his Marine ring, his Marines ring. He was still involved in a lot of these things. So it's really, that was a fascinating look into the story I hadn't heard before. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done episodes on, did Paul McCartney die in the 60s and get replaced by a doppelganger? Because as a kid, who didn't go through that rabbit hole, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, did Elvis fake his own death? And I love that story. And and had a great time. And my, one of my all time favorite interviews was I talked to this woman who believes Michael Jackson faked his death. And if, listen, if anybody in the world had the money and the wherewithal and the weirdness to fake his own death, it was going to be Michael Jackson. So I, I looked over her website. I agreed to have her on. She claims to be in touch with Michael. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So as we're doing the show over the phone, she texts me and says, Michael would like to call in. And I'm like, okay. And I shoot over the number. And all of a sudden, I see my producer pick up the phone. And he's talking. He hangs up. And I go, who was that? He goes, I don't know. He kept calling himself Peter Pan. I go, put him through. And I text her. And I said, sorry, my producer hung up. Put him through. So all of a sudden, I go, we have a phone call. And yeah, hello, Dave. And this, But this person is spot on, Michael Jackson. Like unbelievable. Every nuance, every intonation. And we have this talk and I'm watching at the time we had this live chat room and I'm watching it explode. <laughs> half the group like, holy shit, he's talking to Michael Jackson. The other half's like, this is insane. Why would you give this more on any time? So we're sharing these stories and there are a lot of weird things associated with, did he really die? Uh, everything up to the fact that like when his daughter attempted suicide, which had been like two days before this interview. And I pushed that button and I said, Michael, and I'm going to call you, Michael. I know you want me to call you Peter, but we know why you called in. If you are who you say you are, why are you calling into my little paranormal show two nights after your daughter attempted suicide? And she, and he goes, you don't, you can't always believe the media. It was not exactly as they're portraying it. I'm very aware of what's going on with Paris and everything is under control. And then my my co-host plays this audible and it was an actual voicemail. Dr. Conrad Murray had left for Paris. So here's the man that murdered your father and he's still in touch with her. And the message is like, Paris, I'm sorry, you're going through this. You know, your father's very proud of you. And 
if, if there's anything I can do, just let me know. That's not the phone call of a man who gave a shot to somebody's father and killed them. So it was, there are so many strange hills. And then his, his posthumous album come out, come out called Escape. And it looks like he's in a body bag, right? There's this weird thing in space. Just it, all of it was, it was a great theater of the mind. And so is this guy talking. And we share this moment. And I said, listen, let's put aside all the allegations because nothing has been proven. For what it's worth, thank you for the music and the entertainment. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the gift of entertainment that you gave to the planet. And I just want you to know, I appreciate you calling in. And for all of you listening tonight that are exploding about how dare I, and your numbers are growing, I'm watching it live. I want you to remember that on other nights, we talk about fairies and Bigfoot and ghosts and demons and UFOs and anal probes. And that you can buy into. But the fact that one of the richest, wealthiest, most powerful men on the planet might have needed a mental break and stepped away from life and reality. Let's just let's just think of this one moment that maybe 20 years from now, it's revealed Michael Jackson really is alive. And there was that one night in 2008 that he called into a little radio station in Minnesota and shared his story. Have a good night, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the ride. And I let it go. And it was just this great little way to go out because, mm-hmm. again, it kept it, – it, there was no doubt this guy was not Michael, but he was so good. Mm-hmm. So, And I tried I tried yeah. doing that again you, on you another interview. You did that interview. so well, I really felt like we should sign off. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and no, for Tom that's, and Dave, I'm Dave. Being beautifully yes. done. Yeah, beautifully thank you. Done. No, well, I think that I was thinking recently about the the, the notion of – or the, the public conception of, of conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist mm-hmm. and thinking that's an invented term. Right. And I'm pretty sure it was probably invented by maybe the intelligence community. Oh, you think so? Disinformation, and, Dave? Yeah. And then, and that, that it's, he's uh, onto us, guys. He's on to us. Red yeah. coat three, get Foley out of the picture. Yeah. Cause I'm, I mean, I do believe most conspiracy theories are, are madness and insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that, that there's been an effort made to discredit all conspiracy right. theories when we know for a fact that conspiracies happen all the time, that our government has been caught, uh, mm-hmm. doing, doing terrible things, uh, that they, you know, that they have tried to pass off as conspiracy theories. Um, and in fact, the more they get caught, the more they started the more we started hearing how ridiculous conspiracy theorists are and how we should all just laugh at anyone who has a conspiracy theory, Uh Uh, you know, including the JFK assassination. And now it's, you know, and I, I've fallen prey to it. I know that I have been somebody who throughout most of my life has not been willing to listen to anything about the the JFK assassination. Um, And now I'm going, what now now that people force me to listen to stuff, I go, Oh yeah, it does sound kind of weird. And oh, yeah. that is that is uh, that doesn't that doesn't work. And isn't it <laughs> weird that some of these like there was a recent documentary that just came out where they talked to the emergency room doctor that worked on Kennedy, and he said, and his quote was that the Secret Service told him to say the bullet entered from the rear and then exited from the front, when in fact that is not what they found. And the and the doctor came out and admitted that. Yeah. Yeah, there's an awful lot that um, um, th- yeah, that doesn't make sense and should be looked at and should be yeah. looked at seriously. But we don't because, uh, again, much like the UFO phenomena, uh, we just, you know, the mainstream media just goes, UFOs, oh, nonsense. And you, JFK uh, conspiracies, nonsense. We know for a fact that it was a single gunman and we, we know the guy, we got him, uh, you know. And sadly, uh, we weren't able to avoid him being murdered, you know? Yeah. Which is kind of weird. Hmm. Yeah, very strange. Uh, and you, you do. You look at all these different elements of these stories and how they play into it. But then I, I'll be an apologist, which I almost feel dirty saying. But for some of these things, like the assassination of Kennedy, I had to understand why our government needs to hide that. Because who could live in a world where you fully accept oh, my government killed my president, or the fact that the, um, you, you know, just in, in with UFOs, we've seen the way people react to certain things. 
And mm-hmm. if you suddenly feel like mommy and daddy can't protect you anymore, the world becomes a henny penny and you worry about everything happening and collapsing. And what can we trust? The government's painted themselves into a weird corner where they're like, I think they're trying to find a way to admit it, but they have to be like, ah, but we can't go back to 47. We kind of got to start in 2023 right, or yeah. you know, 2020 when the, the footage starts leaking. We can start to admit to that now because if we admit to what we've said in the past, that means we admit to lying all along. But what we can do is find a way to share the narrative like, hey, we're just as surprised as you. We thought these things were crazy. We didn't even know those elements of the government. And all those people are dead now. We're just uncovering this ourselves. So there's these plausible deniability claims that they're able to insert. So I, I see parts of it. And I see because people react very poorly to things they don't understand. And it can be frightening when the world reacts and when that that global consciousness reaches a fervor, how people can respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very um, sensible and logical way to look at the government's response because it does feel like this uncertain step forward, step back, uh, you know, this part's resisting, this part's pushing forward. It, it's it's clearly a, a time of kind of confusion and and. Uh, you know, and and if you're trying to follow this and you're trying to follow the day to day, it's, you know, it's dizzying and bewildering because this, you know, this part of the government seems to want the truth out. This part of the government doesn't want the truth out. As it relates to the Kenny thing, I was just recalling RFK Jr., regardless of whatever you think of his politics, and he's definitely has some has some theories, but he was talking about his dad uh, and calling the calling the CIA right after the calling, I think, Alan Dulles saying, did you do this? Did you do this? Uh, yeah. You know, that was his first, mm-hmm. that was his first thought. Um, and you can only imagine, right? These are just people just dealing with, dealing with these institutions and some very, you know, a um, lot of stakes, a lot of, it, it, anyway, it, it is, it is fascinating. I personally probably just out of, yes, sort of cowardice, you know, and a, a desire to just stop it somewhere, particularly with the UAP stuff. It, because it it does tend to just sort of pull you down into weirder and deeper and darker territory, and um, at some point I just decide like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. I will uh, I'll you know accept there are some discs maybe in some garages someplace, mm-hmm. and we'll find out what they are, and I won't explore too deeply what our association with them is. Or I think I'm about willing to go there. Um, I wanted to ask you though, sort of as a pivot, because I am curious because okay. I was serious about this being my dream job. It's like, I want to be an in the field ghost, you know, I, that seems to me yeah. an in the field ghost investigator. I've watched more hours of people bumping around in the dark, uh, you know, looking for ghosts than I care to admit to, but it's, we're in the thousands of hours now at this point. So I, as a, as someone who has done this, give us a behind the scenes look when you're, when you're looking around with cameras following you, how, how do you actually ascertain actual phenomenon? Are you, what, what, what is the mindset? Are you actually waiting for things to happen? Do you feel a pressure to create? I mean, just tell me you what know, that's all, like. All solid questions. Uh, and I can tell you that the programs I've been a part of, I've never felt that there was any um, fakery going on with. And if it was, it was stuff that I was unaware of. When we um, did the Holzer Files and Ghost of Devil's Perch, our request was we get to take the chips home, not production who can take them and plug them into computers and use fun little things to make things appear. So they let us at the end of the investigation, we went around and we collected the memory cards Mm -hmm. and poor Shane literally sat in his room for the next two days reviewing footage. And when he came upon something that he wanted either me or the director to weigh in on, he would call one of us in and we'd look at a piece and say, yeah, that's something we want to show or nah, that's garbage. So, None of what I was a part of, I felt was faked. I think, you know, there are dramatic moments that um, we might, you know, you hear something, boom, the car backfires outside and we all turn and that's a commercial break. There was no ghost, but it was, you know, I understand them needing an out as well, Mm -hmm. Uh, but we never made a claim that it was anything supernatural. So I just forgot that there were camera people there. I really just focused on what would I do if I was in here investigating? How would I try to connect with the spirits? And this is what I promise you, Tom. 
Dave, I've already told you this. When you're back out in California and I can arrange a, a time, let's get together and I'll come out there and you guys will go investigate someplace together and I'll bring my recorder and we'll get real time EVP if there's something there. I Chrissy, Chrissy, make a note one one oh nine thirty five. Yeah, okay. We're yeah. going on a ghost hunt with Dave Schrader. Because okay. when we start when we we start when we were talking about starting this, we yeah. we had originally sort of planned on it being much more than just UFOs. Like mm -hmm. we were, like we were talking, because give us because of Tom's experience, uh, you know, with with uh, you know, a haunting in in his youth, you know, that we were, you know, and I had I had my own UFO experience, but we talked about it, and it's it's kind of just been over the last couple of years, the UFOs just won't stop, <laughs> like all of all of the information. There's just well, the news little... is great. This is something yeah. hot button. Why wouldn't you want to keep your finger on that pulse right now? Yeah. I, Totally respect that. And I do want to tell you, I'm also a fan of your show because I love that you take it from this, uh, this kind of esoteric sense of it, nobody knows what's going on and you make it very accessible for all viewers and listeners to be a part of this ride with you. And I appreciate that. And I know they do as well because you're not talking down. You can do it and have some fun and be tongue in cheek, but then get very serious about what these elements really mean about the bigger picture. And that's important. So keep doing what you're doing, man. That that's fantastic. Oh, but you. I will, I'll be happy to go Bigfooting with you oh, and, yeah. okay. uh, and go UFO hunting with you. And Stashwick yeah. said he'll come with us if we go out looking for UFOs. Oh, great. So, oh, good. Hamlin's yeah. on his own though. He likes to just be in the high Sierras yeah. by himself. So yeah, well, Stash is, Stash is fun. He's a good, yeah. he's a good guy to be in the woods with. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, well, you, it's, we'll, we're going to, we will figure that out because, uh, yes, I, I want to, well, tell me, give me a good, what's, what's one of your freakiest in the field moments or what's, what has stuck with you? Or is there a, a particular, like, what the fuck was that? Or something that you All right. don't wish to revisit? Yeah. Please revisit. Uh, there, there's no place, no, nothing I've ever done that I wouldn't want to revisit because I want, I want to just keep pushing the envelope and trying to understand. I, I would say the very first episode I filmed of the Holzer files um, and was, who was Hans Holzer? Just give a brief, like, because sure. he, he was a, I, that was a name I, I wasn't as familiar with. And that's sadly why our show probably didn't go beyond <laughs> okay. two series. Uh, I, I wish they would have called the show Holzer's Ghost Files, mm. because at least the word ghost in the title would have attracted, uh, what is this? Uh, Dr. Hans Holzer was a preeminent paranormal investigator in the United States. He was originally from Austria. He lived here and worked as a journalist who then became involved in the paranormal field, tagging along on some investigations and found that he was adept at doing these things. And he wrote over, I think, 180 books on ghosts, UFOs, psychic phenomena, uh, witches. That's a lot of books. Holy yeah, shit. he was. He had written a bunch of things and he had all these case files that he had investigated and I was lucky enough on my show to be the last program he ever did an interview with. Oh, wow. So there was really? that connection. And I had become friends with his daughter, Alexandra. So when this opportunity to become uh, the lead investigator opened, I, I jumped at it. It was an amazing opportunity. To it's go a back cool concept, too. I love the case yeah. files. I love the fact that these were like, you know, had been investigated. You're going to revisit. I think that's a very cool concept. So I just wanted to get like, yeah, the background. Yeah. But you didn't want to interrupt. You were telling your, your, your uh, sorry, go ahead. Your cool, your. Revisited. Yeah, so that was just going back in and getting those chances are are really astounding. And the first case we we're going to dive into was the Whaley House in San Diego, and I, I thought, oh God, really the Whaley House? Isn't there a better story we can start with? But Hans Holzer put the Whaley House on the map. He's the first one to explode the story of the hauntings that took place there. So I understood why they wanted to start there, and. I went in and I've been friends with guys and gals on every paranormal TV show since, you know, Ghost Hunters launched in 2004, 2005. So I've known these people. I've worked with them. I, I love them. I respect them. I have been on like a dozen episodes of Ghost Adventures and Paranormal State and things. So I've been a part of the, the machine. And so we go to this place. And even though these are friends and people I like, when I see somebody get scratched or pushed or whatever, I'm, there's still that side of me that's like, come on, did that really happen? Did that really, really take place? So when we were in there and we were calling on this one spirit, um, Juan Verdugo, and Juan had been one of these, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the proper terminology. He was a Mexican uh, patriot, if you will, who just his men, they decided we're coming, we're taking back this property from we, this, 
you just took all of this land from us. And they were like the heroes of their story, right? They were the ones coming back to do this. And, and, uh, the townspeople gathered up these intruders and did horrible things from hanging them to making, I think Juan Verdugo was the one that had to dig his own grave. Oh God. And then they all shot him, including Mr. Whaley. And he fell into his grave and they buried him. And we believe that we had encountered this and Violet Whaley had committed suicide, took her own life, sadly. And Mr. Whaley lifted her body, brought her into the house and watched her die and then ran out to go try to find help. And by the time he came back, she had passed. And that's just tragic. And we were standing right near where Violet Whaley had passed. And we were standing in this archway. And that's where the original hangman's noose was. That's where they ended the life of some of these people. And we started engaging. And I said, Juan Verdugo, you were shot by Mr. Whaley. Are, were you responsible for pushing Whaley, you know, Violet Whaley to take her own life? And loud as thunder, a gunshot goes off in the house. And it freaked me and Shane and Cindy, the medium out. We we're all like, what the hell? And I'm like, did we get that on recording? So we played it back and we played it back like three or four times. And the third time we played it, I, you watch the episode, I go slam into Shane and then I fall forward and I hit the ground. So what I had thought is you guys, when you're watching these paranormal TV shows and it's all night vision, you have this false sense of security because it's all lit up for you. We can't see what you're seeing because we're in pitch black. We can't see the night vision lights. And I thought what had happened was a cameraman had come around me to get a shot and probably tripped on the carpet. It was that heavy when it hit me and it slammed me into Shane and then I fell forward. And when I turn around and there's nothing there, it just broke my brain. I could not process what just happened to me. And then I'm even questioning that I just black out and think I fell. Uh, you know, Shane jokes around saying, did that old man just have a heart attack? You know, and <laughs> I, I go outside and I'm trying to collect myself and they had had some weird stuff happen. Like our, we had our executive producer from travel channel had come to watch this first episode get filmed and she was standing outside at one point and they were uh, talking about the ghost and one of the light bulbs above exploded. So she was already unnerved. And then she watched this <laughs> six foot one strapping buck of a man get knocked around like a rag doll. And uh, they called me over and they're like, did you fake this? And I'm like, no, I don't know if I blacked out. I don't know what happened. And they're like, we've watched this footage. And they said, come over and look at this. We can't wrap our head around this. And I'm Dave, you've met me. I'm not a little guy and I'm yeah. certainly not fleet of foot. And they rewind it and show it. And it looks like, like a linebacker hit me from the side. My, my hip lifts, my knees bend and my ankles break. And I, I hit Dan. It's like somebody punched and lifted me. And I'm, I'm not a dancer. It's not like I just threw myself into this crazy pirouette and made yeah. it happen. Yeah. You'd have they, to be a skillful mind. Yeah. yeah. They just kept watching and they're like, I can't, we, I, we can't fathom what just happened to you here. I, we cannot fathom what just happened to you. And there were people, these guys had worked on other paranormal shows and that unnerved all of us. And Cindy and Shane um, stood up against the spirit. I did go back in by myself and kind of address the spirit and apologized for challenging one. And I'm like, I didn't mean it that way. I, I just, I, I wanted to know, were you responsible for influencing her to do this as a form of revenge? It was not meant to be disrespectful. And I'm sorry you took it that way. We will be back. And I'm not going to run away. I want to tell your story and I want to get it right. And I think it was the empathy and love that we showed on the show to the spirit realm and our commitment to giving them a voice that, that made the show so special. And I'm really proud of the 23 episodes we did. And I feel it stands alone and it's not like any other paranormal show that was out uh, in its time. And I'm really proud of those elements. Plus we got a chance to play the actual audio video and photographs from the original investigations from Dr. Hans Holzer. So that was remarkable in itself. Is there a way to, or is it, is it, um, can we catch it someplace? Is there a way to? Uh, yeah. Tubi, uh, the, okay. the free TV service has, uh, has it there. You can check it out on Tubi with commercials. If you have Max, the streaming service, yeah. it is on Max. Oh, so you, oh, can cool. find, yeah. you can find the Holzer files. You can find my follow-up series. Cindy and I went from two seasons of The Holzer Files over to Ghosts of Devil's Perch, which was the fourth season of an ongoing series. The first two seasons were Ghosts of Shepherdstown with Nick Groff and Elizabeth Saint. Season three was The Ghost of Morgan City with Ben Hansen, the UFO uh, enthusiast and, and hunter, and Sarah Lemos, uh, Jeremy Leonard. 
And then season four was a new team. It was Cindy Kaza, the medium, myself and Katie Stafford, the tech. And we stayed for almost four months in Butte, Montana, investigating the claims at the behest of the mayor and the, the police chief. So you can watch Ghost to Devil's Perch there. I did a, a documentary called The Curse of Lizzie Borden that's there. So all of those are out and available to see. And hopefully uh, people will check them out and enjoy them for what they are because we really wanted to get the history right and we tried to treat these stories with respect. But getting knocked on my ass was really a, a game changer for me because I didn't believe that that really happened, that something had that kind of force um, I mean, look how long it took Patrick Swayze to learn to just knock a pop top off a garbage can. Telling you, that's, that, is, so. that is fucked yeah. up. That's yeah. cool, though. I mean, not cool to get knocked over. Cool to hear yeah. the story. Probably not yeah. as much fun to, to get no, knocked it is. on. I, it, it, I feel, you know, I, I got bit on the show. You can see the bite marks appear on my arm. I got knocked over a couple times. I split my back open going backwards into a bathroom. And I literally fell and hit the toilet paper roll. Not heroic in any way, but I split my back open. And people are like, don't you want to just get out of this? I'm like, no, I kind of look at it as a gift from the spirit realm. They apparently feel comfortable enough with me to engage me in a way that gets my attention. And then they see I'm not just going to run out and scream and, and not return. I go back in and I want to help. And I think that's why we got such good uh, response from the spirit realm. My strategy will be to send Dave Foley in first. He's my canary <laughs> in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see what I'm happens to him. I'm, I'm virtually canary sized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what we could do is just put a Especially, rope around your ankle, Dave. So when yeah. you get in deep enough, if something goes bad, Tom and I'll just drag like you back. Like Carol yeah. Ann. Carol Ann. I'm We're going to send Dave in and then we'll, you know, yeah. get them all slimed. Yeah. And no, that this sounds. This Canadian is clean. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. When, if I walk into a room with, with the, in between the two of you, they're going to go, okay, which one of you guys is the ventriloquist? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Dave, you're going. We're going to have, uh, and Dave Schrader will, will bring us to some of the best haunted places just for, yeah. you know, uh, this is, um, this is super fun, by the way. Uh, remind us, it's so Paranormal 60 is the, is the podcast. Uh, yes. The book you have out is Theater of the Mind. No. Yeah. Theater of the Theater Mind, of the Mind. Tales yeah. from the Darkness. And it's mm -hmm. a, a good collection of about 15 different stories, everything from ghosts to UFOs to near-death experiences, uh, monsters, myths, legends, the bloody bones, man, black-eyed kids. So we try to cover a wide swath of strangeness. And, and that's available on Amazon.com. It's the only place I'm selling it is Amazon. So wherever you are in the world, you can buy it on Amazon in either physical form or ebook. Or if you'd like a signed copy, you can go to paranormal60.com and scroll down the front page and you'll see the book there and you can order a signed copy. And I pretty quick at signing and sending them out right away. So uh, that's there as well. That's awesome. Fantastic. And and, and, and you know what I'd like to do? I'll yeah. tell you what, gentlemen, I would like to, for your Patreons, uh, you can hold a little contest and uh, I will give you a, a free copy and you tell me who the winner is and I'll, I'll sign it and send it out Excellent. to one of your Patreons. Let's Patreon. go. Oh, Here we yeah. go. It's already turning around this whole Patreon mm -hmm. thing. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you for that. That's great, My Dave. Pleasure. Sure. Uh, please check out Paranormal Sixty. It's great interviews, great production. It's just really fun, and uh, both um, great. Ex Dave has great experience, and he's he's also a skeptic. So it's just really cool stories, uh, some chilling stories, but you will definitely enjoy. And we uh, really enjoyed this conversation with you, Thank sir. You. Um, and and check I'd love out to, I, I would like to extend the invitation to both of you. I've had Dave visit a few times, but I would love to have both of you on to kind of share your thoughts yeah. and ideas, especially since starting the show to this point. How radically have you changed in your perceptions of the strange and supernatural? So let's get the both mm -hmm. of you on and we'll get yes. we'll the, 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 wide, the widening aperture of our credulity. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. We'll do it. I'd love that. That would be great. Um, we'll do it for sure. And uh, and again, thank you so much. This was super fun. My and pleasure. we look forward to much more. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Dave. Good to Thanks, see Dave. you. Thanks, Dave. Take care. <laughs>